Like, why do we have theory? Yeah. It's a check and use set of rules and theory. Yeah. Uh, so can anyone think about why it might be important that we have theory? Yeah. So that like, people can't like run into some arguments? Yeah, exactly. So I think theory is one of the most uh, important things that we have in debate because uh, have you, raise your hand if you've heard like a horror story about something that's happened before theory existed. Okay, so before theory existed, uh, people would have really, really abusive strategies uh, that would contain a lot of things that would make it really, really hard to win um, unless you had some sort of other out. So raise your hand if you know what an a priori is. Uh, I want to give a definition. Um, it's like something that happens, like not materially, like something before. Yeah, exactly. So an a priori is like a reason that you vote affirmative or negative, like absent, uh, generating offense underneath the framework because, wait, what's your name? Brian. Okay. Um, yeah, so like you're not proving the truth of the resolution because there'd be some pragmatic benefit to it or because we should firm underneath your framework. Um, it would be an argument that functions on a higher level. Uh, so examples of this are, wait, what's your name? Andrea. Okay. No worries. Um, so examples of an a priori might be Resolved means the resolution has been firmly determined bef before the round, which means that it's already decided that AF is true, so you should automatically affirm. Uh, resolved means uh, firmly determined to do something uh, and said in a confident voice. And yes, I did say the resolution in a confident voice, which means that you should automatically affirm. Uh, or maybe on like the freedom of speech topic, it would mean uh, it's contradictory to say that freedom of speech is bad because you use speech to say that, which means you should automatically affirm. So imagine you're in a situation where you hit someone and their AF is just six minutes of arguments like that. And so you have to waste seven minutes of your MC answering every single one of these arguments. Uh, otherwise, if you drop a single one of them, uh, like if you answer everything and you drop resolved means I am firmly determined the resolution is true, then you lose and the round's over. So I think that's why we need theory, uh, because if we don't have theory, people will just do awful things, uh, and then debate will be destroyed. Uh, so theory is a really important tool that you have uh, when people try to make rounds bad, and you can use theory as something to enforce that debate is something that remains educational, that debate remains something that you have the capacity to engage in. Uh, so it's definitely a really important tool to have um, in your toolbox. I went to uh, Ram Prasad's lecture. I don't know how many of you guys know who he is. Uh, when I was a sophomore, and he said that uh, whenever you approach a round, you should try to imagine the perfect round in your head uh, and exactly the way that you want everything to go, so the kinds of arguments you want to be able to read. Uh, and every time someone does something that makes you angry uh, and that deviates from your ideal perfect debate world, uh, you read theory. So I think that's like a, a good way to approach theory, that uh, theory is a way that you can defend your perfect ideal model of debate in which everything goes perfectly um, and people are able to learn uh, and engage substantively, um, and you're not excluded from reading arguments you think are super important. Uh, so with that, uh, we're going to jump into the structure of the theory shell. Um, so someone said that uh, theory is about like imposing norms and rules on debate. Uh, so what do you think the first part of a theory shell would be? Yeah? The interpretation. Yeah, so what's that? Um, it's the norm that you want to set for the rule. Yeah. Uh, so... Does anyone have an example of like an interpretation? Yeah. Uh, the negative debater may not be applying implicit. Yeah. Um, so it's basically just like this is a thing that all debaters must do, um, and then there'd be a violation, uh, or and then you would be constructing your interpretation based on what it is that they did that was bad. Um, so like, let's say you're hitting the wild a priori app where the app is just like six minutes of a priori. Um, you might say, like, debaters may not have uh, multiple independent pre-standard reasons to affirm, or debaters must only, like, affirm the resolution um, through offense linking back to a framework. Uh, they can't affirm it in any other way. Um, so, yeah, the interpretation is basically just, like, this is a rule that all debaters must follow. Uh, so if you have a rule that um, all debaters must follow, what do you need in order to prove that the judge should vote on it? Like, can you win off of a theory shell if your opponent followed your rule? Why? Yeah? Um, because, like, you didn't violate anything, so the norm is broken, so therefore, like, the theory doesn't help. 
Yeah. Um, so, does anyone know what the second part of the theory shell is called? Yeah. Violation. Right. Uh, so, the violation is just the way in which your opponent did not follow your rule. Um, so it's what they did wrong. They read an app that was six minutes of a priori. They read a plan. They read a pick. Um, so you have your rule, and you say that they violated your rule. What do you need after that? Right. Yeah. So the standards will be like the offense that you have that articulates why your rule is a good rule for us to have in game. Um, so we will go back to this and discuss it in um, more depth, but does anyone know what comes after standards? Yeah. Uh, voters. Yeah. So what are voters? Uh, like, so what, generally speaking, the fairness and education and stuff is like, kind of like framing our yeah, exactly. So, uh, in the same way, like a roll of the ballot would tell you uh, that tell the judge like these are the things that you care about. Like you should be concerned with minimizing practi oppressive practices in debate, um, or if you're voting for like a policy option that functions as a liberatory strategy. Um, voters would say that the judge is constrained by these like particular obligations, um, which would link to your standards level offense. Uh, so you mentioned fairness and education. Uh, can anyone think of like why we might care about fairness or education in debate? Yeah. Uh, well, like fairness because like if debate is like a competitive activity, and, like the better debaters should probably like win the round. And, like if the round is unfair, you can't really determine that. Yeah. Uh, so there will be a lot of like justifications for fairness. We'll center along the idea like. Debate is a competitive activity, which means that if there's some sort of like unfair skew, um, then that goes against the nature of debate because there's supposed to be like a winner and a loser based on uh, decided based on merit. Uh, another argument people will make is stuff about how like if there's some sort of abusive practice on substance, um, like the judge doesn't have the ability to determine who is actually winning it because people are using things like tricks in order to skew the round. Uh, so like. Let's say in a situation where your opponent takes a glass of water and they like pour it all over your computer. Uh, and then you can't pull up blocks to their AF. Like, were they the better debater? Right. Uh, so fairness says that there are certain constraints on what it means to like do the better debating. Um, and that the round has to be fair and people have to be on a level playing field with equal ability to engage um, coming into the round. Uh, so this is why theory will function on like a higher level than substance. So like if you're winning offense to your AF and you're like, human enhancement technology is awful, we have to ban it, and your opponent's like, you read a thousand a priori in the AF. I don't know how you did it, but you read a thousand of them, which means you should lose, and you lose theory. Like, it doesn't matter that you've proven that human enhancement technology is immoral, um, because there's this like procedural question about the way in which you prove that human enhancement technology that says that the way in which you approach the round makes it so that even if it like looks like you're winning the AF contention, uh, the judge isn't actually in a position to adjudicate that because you skewed the round in such a significant way that I was never going to win the AF contention. I was not going to answer every thousand a priori while I was giving my NC, which means that there's this procedural question that comes before, so like you have to adjudicate theory before you can adjudicate substance. Does that make sense to everyone? Fist to five on everything we've done so far. Fist is like, no idea what's happening. Five is like, I'm totally good. OK, do you want to ask a question? Is What what uh, did I talk about that you're like confused about? Um, nothing really. OK, is anyone who's like does not at five right now want to ask a question? I saw you, were you at four? Um, I was just confused. Uh, sort of confused between standards and voters. Are they like closely related or are they like just confused at how like they're related? Yeah, so we'll talk about that like more specifically when we go back to standards. Um, but the standards are just going to be like the link between your interpretation and your voter. Uh, so the voter says we care about fairness. Um, so we've talked about fist to five on like why we care about fairness in debate. You don't necessarily have to agree, but like, okay. 
Cool. Anyone have an idea why we care about education? Yeah. It's the only reason schools fund debate. Um, it's only from the impact. Yeah, so uh, education arguments uh, will be stuff about like what makes debate valuable. Um, so things that are like, we are only here because we get education from it. The activity only exists because it's educational. Um, yeah, so those will be the sorts of arguments you're making for educational, for education. Um, so these are just kind of like the framing issues where you're like, these are the things that the judge should care about when they're evaluating, evaluating a theoretical debate. So like, because we care about fairness, because we care about education, that means that we want to find the rules that are fair and educational. Um, yeah, so that links back to, so we're gonna jump back to the standards question, um, which will probably address uh, what you were talking about. Uh, so standards will be specific to your rule, um, and they're what serves the link between the interpretation um, and the voters. Uh, so there are a lot of really common standards, and we're gonna go through them now, uh, that are usually the sorts of like, claims that people will make when they're linking back to either fairness or education. Um, so, can anyone, has anyone like heard a common standard before? Uh, and I'm gonna categorize them into like fairness and education standards. But yeah. Time skew? Yeah, so it's time skew. Um, because of some argument, uh, one side has more time than the other. Yeah, so, Here's an example of this. Let's say like your opponent uh, screamed over the last minute of your <laughs> one AR. Like they're just like, the judge is not hearing this. Like I don't want the judge to listen to the last minute of your one AR. You can read a theory shell that's like, my opponent may not interrupt my one AR because it skews my time. And then obviously it's gonna be much harder for me to win the round if like I just literally had like one less, one few minutes to make arguments than you did. Like, obviously I'm going to be at an advantage. Obviously I'm not going to be able to, like, answer as many things as you will, um, because I just can't make any, as many arguments to win the round. Um, so time skew is usually some sort of, like, quantitative claim uh, about the amount of time you had to, like, deal with arguments. Uh, another, like, way in which time skew is often used uh, is, like, so let's say you are defending, like, human enhancement technology is generally immoral. Uh, and the negative debater reads a pick, which is just like a counterplan that's like, human enhancement technology is always immoral, except in the case of like uh, eyewitness testimony. Like if we use uh, human enhancement technology to enhance eyewitness memory so that people like can testify, which means that we can catch criminals. Um, so they're agreeing with the majority of the arguments in the AF. They're just saying there's this like tiny, tiny exception to the AF. Um, so when people are reading a shell against things like that, they'll always, they'll often use time skew as a justification because they'll say like, when you just make a tiny exception to the general rule of my app, uh, it makes me really, it really hard for me to leverage the six minutes of arguments I spent developing in the AC because they don't really become relevant um, in the context of the counterplan because the counterplan is much more specific than the app. So I basically have to like start over in the one AR. Uh, so a lot of time skew arguments are about things that like, moot a majority of a speech. Uh, so like, people might read theory against things like, if you read an AF and then they read turns to it and they read an NC and you like kick out of the AF framework and you can see the NEG framework and the 1AR. Uh, someone might read theory, I mean I don't think it's a great shell, but they might read theory and say like, you skewed my time when you kicked out of the AF because you get this big positive time trade off because the negative debater has to like spend time answering it. Any questions about time skew? Is anyone like unclear on what time skew means? Because I can give more examples. Cool, fist to five on time skew. Okay, cool. Uh, can anyone think of another standard? Uh, yeah. Ground skew, ground Yeah, so let's talk about ground for now. Um, <laughs> so let's say someone reads an AF um, on this topic and they're like, Human enhancement technology is immoral for this specific person um, who's using human enhancement technology to make themselves strong enough and smart enough that they can make atom bombs all on their own and they're going to end the world. Why might that not be like a fair AF? Like, why might it be hard to answer that AF? Yeah? Be like zero actually like, yeah. yeah, exactly. So, like, ground is sort of just like the quality and quantity of arguments that you can make. Um, so like, 
qualitative is like how many good arguments are you able to make against a particular position. Uh, so for example, if someone like parametricizes their advocacy and they read a plan uh, such that there's just like literally no good negative arguments against it. Uh, your qualitative ground is really, really bad because it's super hard for you to actually have access to good arguments that prove that the app is bad. Um, quantitative ground is just kind of like, do you have access to like a diversity of arguments? Um, so it seems like in the instance of the app where you spec one person on this topic, uh, there'd be a loss of both qualitative and quantitative ground um, because it's really hard to prove that this one guy should make themselves smart enough to make nuclear weapons all the time. Uh, and also, even if there was an argument, there's probably not that many of them. Uh, so it's super, super hard for you to win. Questions about ground? All right, cool. Um, so anyone, are there any other standards people have heard before? Did you have your head up before? Yeah. Um, so Stratsky is basically like your capacity to do a good job choosing a strategy, so like deciding what arguments you're going to read against the position, deciding what case you want to defend, deciding what your advocacy is going to be. Uh, those sorts of things are all essential components of your strategy. Um, and there might be things that people can do that make it much harder for you to have a strategy. Uh, so let's say that someone uh, is defending, they just like say, I will defend the human enhancement technology as immoral. Um, and you, and then they have some sort of advocacy, and they have like, their only contention level cards are about steroids. And you're like, wait, so do you defend all human enhancement technologies as immoral, or do you just defend steroids are immoral? And they're like, I'll tell you in the 1AR. Like, that's probably pretty bad for your strategy, because if the app has the ability to just like, redefine what their advocacy says, depending on what your arguments are, then like, it's very hard for you to decide what sorts of claims you're gonna make. So like, if they just defend that steroids are bad, then maybe you want to read a shell that's like you have to defend all forms of human enhancement technology. Uh, whereas if they just defend stero or whereas like if they defend the whole resolution, maybe you would want to read like a counterplan about another form of human enhancement technology. Uh, so a lot of the Stratsky claims will be related to issues of advocacy. So like if someone just refuses to tell you what they defend, it's really, really hard to formulate a strategy against that sort of position uh, because you just don't know what offense likes to it. Uh, yeah? Uh, how would you frame a shell in a debate round? Like, if they're running something abusive, how would you, like, set up a show? Uh, so you'd set it up following this format. Uh, so you'd be, like, interpretation, uh, or, like, do you have a particular example for what you're thinking of? Let's just say they're running, like, steroids only, right? How would you say that's, like, abusive? Would you just say it is? Yeah, so you'd be, like, A is the interpretation. Uh, debaters must defend that all forms of human enhancement technology are immoral. They may not just defend a particular form of human enhancement. B is the violation. They just defend that steroids are bad. Uh, C are the standards, and then you would just, you would articulate these standards in terms of arguments linking to fairness indication. Uh, so you'd be like, excuse my ground, most of the literature says that steroids are super, super bad, which means I don't have access to that many arguments. Um, it like, or yeah, there are other things that we'll talk about more that would like be offense on that. And um, then you'd be like, D is the voter. Fairness is a voter because the judge has to vote for the better debater, not the better cheater, which they can't do if the round is skewed. Um, and there are other things that will come after that that we'll talk about when we're done. Uh, any other questions on what we've covered so far? Cool. Uh, can anyone think of more standards? Yeah. Yeah, so this would be um, an education argument. It's not as much of a standard as I think it's like a weighing argument. So uh, we'll talk about, uh, so like education weighing can be issues of like, how much education we're getting versus, or like how many things we're learning about versus how deep we're going. Um, but most of the education standards will be like a particular form of education, so that'd be a weighing argument that'd fall under them. Yeah. Policy making education? Yeah. Um, so, what is policy making education? Education on policy. Yeah, basically. It's like our capacity to like learn about the government and like role play and learn about how uh, the consequences of particular policy would like impact our decision making. Um, so, generally, these kinds of arguments will be stuff about like why you should have access to ex like preclusive counter plans or why you should have access. Uh, to parameter, or like on this resolution, 
Um, maybe it would be a reason why you should be able to specify the government taking a particular action. Um, so there are different like components of policymaking education. Uh, maybe it's the capacity to learn about political issues, or maybe it's the capacity uh, to actually just like defend uh, and pretend that we're policymakers in a particular round. Um, but those are the sorts of arguments that would fall there. Any other standards? Yeah. So. Reciprocity is pretty intuitive. Does anyone who hasn't spoken want to take a stab at what they think reciprocity means? It's like, or I'll give you an example of reciprocity. Um, you just defend like human enhancement technology is bad and your opponent reads like 10 counter plans about all different forms of human enhancement technology and they'll be like, I'll go for one of them in the 2 and R. I won't defend all of them throughout all the round. Yeah? Um, like when like your opponent only has to have offense against one thing, but you have to have offense against like ten different things. Yeah, exactly. So reciprocity is usually about uh, distribution of burdens. Um, so like if you have more obligations that you have to fulfill to win the round than your opponent does, uh, then that usually means that there's some sort of skew in reciprocity. Um, so like if your opponent has access to particular strategies that you don't have access to, uh, if you have more burdens that you have to meet in order to win the round, uh, those are all things that would link back to reciprocity. Um, so let's talk about the plan example. Can anyone think of a reason why like a plan might be unfair? Where you just defend a specific form of human enhancement technology being bad? Someone who hasn't spoken. Yeah. Um, if they have a plan, then the, ne like, the negative would have to specify that why that exact thing is immoral. Uh-huh. Probably leads, like, a yeah. Um, so this is called predictability. Um, yeah. So it could be like predictability slash like research burden. Um, arguments about how like if AF can specify, you have like a really large research burden because you have to prep every single potential AF because like you don't necessarily know what they're gonna read. Uh, and it's really hard to like prepare specific offense against something um, if you don't have the capacity to predict it. Uh, like it's hard if someone just like reads a new surprise AF where they talk about a kind of human enhancement technology you're not familiar with um, and you don't have prep on that, it's really hard to engage in one round. Uh, do you have another reason why plans might be bad? I was gonna say like, yeah, definitely. So I think that would be a very compelling argument for ground against a plan, uh, because you'd say like, if a plan is super specific, I don't have access to a lot of offense that I can generate against the plan, which puts me at an advantage, a disadvantage. Anything else? Yeah. Clash. Yeah. Uh, so, what is clash? Well, yeah, uh, so I think clash is a super important um, argument for education. So clash is just basically like the ability to sort of have uh, substantive engagement where you're making like comparative arguments between your opponent's position and your own position, um, not just making sort of like preclusive arguments. So something like uh, a skew and predictability or research burdens might be something that impedes clash because like if there isn't access to uh, a lot of types of arguments you can make against a particular app, uh, it's hard for you to like actually engage with a lot of the substance of the app. <coughs> um, anyone have any questions about anything so far? Yeah. Um, can you explain the breath, like, vendor deck? Yeah, so uh, breadth of education is just like how many things are we learning about, um, and depth is how much do we know about each particular thing. Um, so like, Maybe if everyone in each round is just going to read a different plan where they talk about a different form of human enhancement technology, like you learn about a lot of forms of human enhancement technology, but you're not discussing one of them for the entire topic, so you're not going to know as much about each thing individually. And people will make weighing arguments as to like why one of them is better than the other. Why it's better to understand something deeply versus to just like know about a lot of things. Yeah. So just to clarify, Clash is basically like, since I had no way to be prepared about their specific plan, there's limited Clash and no top education. 
Yeah, so that's like one potential argument for clash. It's just kind of like your ability to engage in their arguments um, and how much the round is decided by like straight on argument comparison. Uh, so in the situation where someone read an app that was like six minutes of a priori, um, there's probably not a lot of clash because they'll just extend whatever a priori you dropped without actually having to like engage and maybe you read an interesting MC or an interesting K. Uh, none of that stuff is gonna matter because it's just about like preclusion. Clash is just kind of about engagement in general. Um, but you mentioned um, another standard which is important, which is um, topic education. Um, so that's just like pretty intuitively how much we're learning about the topic. Uh, people will make arguments as to why that outweighs um, by saying stuff like we only have the topic for two months, whereas like we'll be able to have philosophical discussions in every resolution, which means education pertaining to like this particular topic outweighs things like pretending to be policymakers because we can just pretend to be policymakers another time. Um, what other kinds of education do we care about? I'll give you a hint. It's like the reason that LD is different from other forms of debate. Someone who hasn't participated. It's pretty, or like, what is every, what is every like general affirmative need at the beginning? Framework. Yeah. So what do we learn about when we have framework debate? Um, yeah, exactly. Philosophy education. Um, so it's just our ability to learn about ethical issues. Um, in debate, people will say it's important because philosophy makes us better critical thinkers um, because it's the function of LD. Um, stuff like that. Cool. Anyone want to add anything else? Um, so there's another standard that links to education um, that I think is important. So like, does it matter if what you learn in debate is applicable out of round? Yeah. It's real world education, I guess yeah. that was important. It's, can you take something out of the debate? So what should you take the actual then the black debate? Yeah, exactly. Real world education is like, it's just like, is what we're learning in this debate round, does this matter? Is this going to be relevant to the rest of our lives? Um, so I think that is pretty much it for uh, education standards. Unless, is there anything anyone else wants to add to education? Yeah. Um, isn't there something like anti-spreading theory? Like, what would a standard for that be? I mean, I think anti-spreading theory is like silly, but I guess if you were to read it, um, you'd read some sort of standard about like inclusion in debate, and you'd be like, some people don't understand spreading, which means it's harder for them. Um, and then okay, you'd read. Isn't that like really like a with like a whole bunch of like you learn more stuff, so then like there's like ten other educational theories that you yes. it. Yeah, that's and why it's, so it's not common. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, no one reads it. Uh, there was like a, a point in time where like a couple of people read it, but like I I never debated someone reading anti-spreading theory. Also, like, a general rule of thumb is that if your opponent doesn't spread, you shouldn't either, just because it's, like, a nice thing to do. So if that's the case, then you won't hit spreading theory. Um, yeah. Any other fairness standards you guys think are important to talk about? Can I take a general question? Yeah. How often have you did disclosure theory? Yeah, okay. um, well, I always disclosed, so. <laughs> so never, but... Yeah, you could ask, I know uh, Trent didn't disclose, so you could ask him about it. I would recommend disclosing, though. Uh, people think that disclosing is something where, like, you're going to start losing rounds because people have access to your cases, but, like, I don't know. It really didn't. I was much more successful after I started disclosing than before, so those are my feelings. But disclosure, disclosure is, like, a separate question. Or does everyone here know what disclosure is? Okay, cool. Um, any other fairness arguments? We got most of them. Uh, I think one more that's relevant uh, to the plan debate. Uh, so like imagine in every round uh, on the human enhancement technology topic, someone just specifies like a different person. Like they're just like 
Jane shouldn't, it's immoral when Jane uses human enhancement technology. It's immoral when Fred uses human enhancement technology. Why might that be bad? Is there like a limit to the number of apps they can read? Right, why might that be bad? Yeah, do you want to add to that? Yeah, exactly, so like, uh, limits, that's a standard you'll often see on like shells against picks and certain counters and counterplans and against plans. So it's just basically like, if there's an infinite number of advocacies that you could potentially read, uh, that's super, super bad for me because I have to be prepared to hit like any AF out of a billion AFs, whereas you just have to be prepared to defend one of them, uh, which means that I'm always going to be at a substantive disadvantage um, on the theory debate, I mean on the substance debate. Someone also I heard say uh, PrepSQ. Uh, so PrepSQ is just like, it is much harder for you to prepare for this round than for your opponent to because your prep is split in a thousand or like actually in this context uh, billi billions of different directions uh, whereas they just have to focus on one issue. Any questions about any of these? Yeah. So I've heard app and like flex uses standards. Where would those fit under? Yeah, so those would be like uh, fairness arguments. Um, so these generally go along the lines, these aren't great arguments, but like, uh, you'll hear things like this if it's like, when people are justifying a plan, they'll say it's really hard to affirm because you get to be responsive to my position, uh, you can preclude the app with a lot of like, nuanced counter plans, uh, I only have four minutes to respond to the seven minute long NC. Uh, which means that I need the ability to be flexible with my decision of what advocacy to read. So it's better if I read a plan because that compensates for some sort of pre-existing abuse. Um, an alternate argument for like negative flexibility might be like, it is really hard to be responsive to an AF because the AF hasn't interacted their arguments with mine yet. Um, and so what each argument will mean and like how the framework works and like what the underview arguments would apply to uh, is going to depend on what they do in the 1AR which means that Nick has to have some sort of flexibility to respond to that. Does that make sense to everyone? Fist to five on everything we've done so far. You in the back. All right, cool. What are you at? What's your, all right. Uh, do you want to ask it a question? Um, what is the whole, pol what is the whole policy making education thing? Uh, yeah, so it's just like, your capacity to learn about political issues and to like role play as policymakers. Uh, so, let's say if the affirmative imagines they're passing a, or like has an advocacy where they're like the government should ban use of human enhancement technology, um, they might say that that's good because we get to role play as the government and um, we get to like read articles about what the government is obligated to do, what the consequences would be about a particular policy. Um, so it's like we get to think about uh, important policy issues from the perspective of policymakers, which is like important for debate. Uh, there might be some sort of arguments about how like a lot of debaters become politicians, so it's necessarily uh, an important skill for that. Do you have any other questions? Okay, anyone have questions before we move on? All right, uh, so that's the bulk of the standards. Um, so in voters, um, an important component of the voters of a shell, or is it okay if I erase this stuff? Does, anyone, does everyone have all this written down? Okay. Um, so you guys don't have to know like what the term is for these things, um, but like imagine you've justified this is a rule my opponent should follow, they broke the rule, uh, it is a good rule for debate, uh, judges should care about like fairness in education and my rule is most maximally fair and educational. Uh, what else would you need to get the judge to vote on it? Yeah. Are we able to drop them because they were, uh, or like are we to drop the debate here? Yeah, uh, so you need, Implications on theory. Does the shell necessarily have to be dropped in yeah. What? Yeah. So, uh, this is the section of the shell that's uh, concerned with implications. So, uh, implications just means like, so I've won my rule is good and that they broke it. What does the judge do? Uh, so, drop the debater pretty intuitively is just like, 
they did something so bad, the round is like irredeemably skewed. Uh, you can't evaluate substance, which means that uh, you should drop them because they were really unfair and uneducational. Um, can anyone think of a reason why it might be good to drop the debater? Yeah. Uh, norms, the loss of future views. Yeah. Um, so, if you can just read a bajillion unfair arguments, and then every time your opponent reads theory, then that argument just goes away. Uh, it seems like you have a pretty good time trade-off because, like, if you have the like AF and you just like, let's say you have a regular AF and you just like sprinkle lots of a priori's in there. Um, if your opponent drops the a priori's and they miss them, um, then like the round is over and you won regardless of what's happening anywhere else. Uh, which means that you're probably pretty incentivized to just keep reading them if like theory just means that those arguments go away because the strategic value of reading them is really really high. Um, so it's more likely to set a norm if like every time people read a priori they lose rounds because people will think, oh, there is a really big strategic trade-off to deciding to like read these sorts of arguments, so uh, I'm going to decide not to do them. Does that make sense, everyone? Um, what's another reason why? Yeah. The gateway issue, unfair arguments do the rest of the round so it's can't get evaluated. Mm -hmm. um, so you would say, like, substance is irredeemably skewed. Um, like, even if those arguments went, go away, like, I spent so much time on theory, which means that you can't even evaluate substance at all. Um, I think one argument that's to, connected to norm setting is just deterrence, uh, which says like you're less likely to keep doing this in the future um, if you lose now, and your loss will serve as a deterrent to you. Uh, can anyone think of anything else? Like, is it hard to win if every time your opponent does something unfair, you have to spend like two minutes reading a theory show, and then you also have to win substance. Yeah. Uh, times you drop the argument, they can kick it off. It's for bottom of the time period. Are you reading your notes from? Yeah. Or you should close it to like practice and make sure okay. you remember things. Um, so, yeah. So time skew. Like, you had to waste all this time on theory, uh, which means that like it would be a positive time trade up for them to read these arguments. Uh, so. You should, it should be like round over because you already had to waste all this time winning your theory shell. Uh, does this make sense, everyone? Cool. Uh, so what's the reason that maybe the argument should go away rather than uh, the debater should lose? Definitely. Yeah. Uh, drop the arguments for less theory. People will just run theory for the sake to drop them later and then uh, Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, so frivolous theory is just like the idea people will read a bunch of theory shells that aren't true. Um because like if theory is dropped the debater, um then you can just like easily collapse the round to a higher level. Um it would be like a game changer for you if you're able to win the shell, even if there's like a super, super marginal abuse story. Uh, so the claim is like, if instead of dropping the debater, you drop the argument, people are less incentivized to do things like that uh, because there's also a reward for winning theory. And like, let's say there's like one unfair, like there's like one kind of unfair like spike in the app or something, or like a tiny unfair argument, you read theory on it. That doesn't seem like it's like a game changer for the round. Um, it seems like if that argument goes away, you can just have substantive discussion. Um, anything else? I think this is like pretty sufficient for now. There are more arguments you can make, but I think um, that's probably enough. Fist to five on uh, drop the debate or v drop the argument. Cool. Uh, so, who thinks that we? Sh or do you guys think that it's more strategic to read drop the debate or drop the argument if you're initiating theory? Yeah. Does anyone want to say why? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, there's no reason to make theory less offensive for you than it has to be. 
Um, cool. So, does anyone know what comes after drop the debater? Yeah. <laughs> or. Or advisory Yeah. Um, so this is basically just like a framing issue that determines what matters on, or like how we evaluate offense on theory and what counts as offense. Um, so imagine you're in a situation and someone reads, does everyone know the difference between like a sans serif font and a serif font? A serif font is just like this, and a sans serif font is like that. And apparently these are easier to read. Uh, so let's say your opponent like reads a shell and they're like, my, like everyone's case has to be format, formatted in like serif fonts instead of sans serif fonts because it's easier to read. Why might that shell be like bad? Yeah. Well, like, um, you can probably still read it even if it's in like, a sans serif, so like it doesn't actually like deter your ability to like work it out. Yeah, exactly. So um, it might be the claim that like even if it's a little bit more fair educational for you to do one thing than another thing, it doesn't significantly enough impede your capacity to engage in the round that like the round should come down to theory. Um, so that is that is what you would say when you're using a reasonability paradigm to evaluate the debate. Uh, so reasonability says that like it's not an issue of whether or not uh, you're choosing the interp or the counter interpretation that's most fair educational. Um, it's just a question of like is what you did bad enough uh, to mean that the round ends. Uh, so there are like different things that people will use to define what reasonability means. Uh, sometimes it'll just mean like the judge should intervene and if they think that your shell is ridiculous then they should obviously not vote on it. Um, there might be other things people will read. Sometimes people will say like if you have, ac if I disclosed my case before the round uh, that means that you shouldn't have access to theory uh, because like it was sufficient, like you have sufficient time to prepare and to engage with my case, but thus that I couldn't have done something unfair enough that we can, can't get down to substance. Um, so if reasonability is just like what you did wasn't bad enough to lose you the round, uh, what do you think competing interests might be? Is that a hand? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so the way in which a debate will structure around theory is that someone will read an interpretation and they're like, debaters may not uh, defend only one form of human enhancement. Um, and then their opponent will defend, uh, will say like counter interpretation. I may read, I may just defend one form of human enhancement technology. Uh, so the counter interpretation says like, the counter interpretation is just like, I may do what your rule says I'm not allowed to do. Um, so competing interps would just say like, my counter interpretation is better than your interpretation. Uh, so you'd have to prove like, it is proactively better to read cases in serif fonts than san or to read cases in sans serif fonts than to read cases in serif fonts. Uh, and that's the only way you read the theory debate. Uh, if you're just like, it wasn't that unfair, you still could have answered the app. You'd still lose theory because you don't have offense. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Cool, yeah. So competing in terms is just the idea of evaluating theory in an offense-defense paradigm. So you're like, we are just going to choose the best rule in debate. It doesn't matter how like marginal a difference there is between different rules. Um, it's just a question of like, is this rule better than the other one? Um, cool. Uh, so the last thing is the um, RVI debate. Uh, so. RVI stands for reverse voting issues. Um, so that basically means like, if I beat back theory, um, so like, th let's say I read a theory shell and I'm like, you should lose because you specified a specific form of human enhancement technology. Um, and my opponent is like, counter interpretation, I should be able to specify B, I meet standards, like policy making education enables us to talk about particular issues uh, clash enables us to focus the debate on one thing. It's hard to talk about all forms of human enhancement technology at the same time. Uh, they make a lot of arguments. They win the theory debate. Uh, do they win the round? Like if I've proven that uh, I wasn't fair, or that I was fair and I was educational, do I win? No. Yeah, so it seems like the default is like I don't necessarily win uh, just because I proved I was fair. Um, 
But what might be a reason that that's bad? Like, what might be a reason that I should be able to win? Yeah. Well, then people, like, people would just, like, run a bunch of theory because that's a no-risk issue for them. Yeah. So, like, for a risk theory, you get to take the risk. Yeah, exactly. Like, if every time I read a frivolous theory shell, like a theory shell about a really marginal abuse story or a theory shell that's false, um, if I can either win the round or I just have to waste my opponent's time answering the theory shell, uh, that seems like a pretty good time trade-off for me. So it's very possible that um, enabling there to be an, a reverse voting issue, which is just uh, when your opponent wins a counter-interpretation and they prove that their norm was good for debate, uh, enabling them to win off of that seems to make it less likely that I'm going to read theory when there's just like no big violation of fairness or education. Um, what are other reasons potentially RBIs would be good? Yeah. Reciprocity. So both actually will win the theory. Yeah. Um, so your claim would just be along the lines of like, it's super bad that they're able to win on theory just because they initiated. Uh, and I have to spend an equivalent amount of time beating back their interpretation. But even if I do that, I still have to win substance. Uh, so it seems pretty irreciprocal that they can win on it, and you can't. Yeah. Uh, so if you do have a counter. Um, well, so you don't need implications necessarily because uh, when someone is reading theory, they will like read implications with their shell. Um, but it might be the case that you like want to contest their implications. So uh, there might be a situation in which you know you're on the wrong side of the theory issue. Uh, so you might want to read like drop the argument instead of drop the debater. Or you might want to read like I get RVIs because whenever people initiate theory, they'll say you don't get RVIs because that's strategic for them. Uh, so you might want to contest their paradigm issues depending on what they say. Uh, what is, what's the reason that RBIs might be bad? Like, why should someone not win just for being fair? Yeah. Well, like, um, then it would kind of, like, show the theory, because, like, if they're, if they're, like, thinking that their opponent is, like, a really good theory debater, then, like, even if there's an abuse of practice, they still would, like, call them out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. RBIs, like, are asking for a teaser of theory debating. Um, so people can read abusive arguments to people, so they can have theory run against them, and then read RBI as good and win off of that. So yeah. Theory debate. Exactly. Uh, so this is uh, probably true in some instances, like when people, or I don't know if people who read plants are necessarily baiting theory, um, but it's definitely the case that people who read plants are super, super prepped out on the theory debate, um, and would probably love to be able to win off of the plans good, plans bad debate with you, uh, because that's something that they've spent a lot of time preparing for. Um, so this also means that like, it's not necessarily the case that just because someone wins their counterinterpretation, uh, they're actually on the right side of the issue. It might just be the case that they're just doing like, uh, a ton of preparation for the debate because they know it's something that they're doing that's unfair and they just want to uh, be able to get out of that debate if it ends up happening. Um, anything else? Do you guys think it's true that like, your opponent needs to be able to win on a counterinterpretation uh, to win on the theory debate. Like, is the only way that you can win on theory by winning a counterinterpretation? Why? Well, so you can win the standards debate on your counterinterpretation, but that doesn't mean you win the round, because if there's no RVIs, it means if you win your counterinterp. Uh, then the debate just goes back to substance. How can you win on theory without, uh, like, without just winning a counterinterpretation with an RBI? Yeah. Um, um, if, like, I guess you could say uh, you can make arguments that might be official or something like that. I mean, like that would get you the offense, but like, like you can still like zero. Mm -hmm. How can you generate offense on theory? Uh, so that would be offense on your counter term. So like, if you have offense that says your, proacti your practice was proactively good for debate, uh, you know, still don't win the round because uh, that would just mean like what you did was good, so you shouldn't lose. Uh, so it would go back to substance, yeah. Considering your counter interpretation, you can just try and gain offense on their standards. Yeah, so these are all ways, but like if you do that, do you win the round on theory? more offense on the RBS than the SF. Yeah. 
So there has to be an RBI though, but how do you win on theory absent an RBI? Yeah. They counter Yeah, so that's one thing to do. You could say like counter interpretation, uh, debaters may not read theory against like plans or something. Or they may not debaters may not read theory that says that I may not read a plan. I think those arguments are kind of silly though. because um, it's like it'll generally just be like and you deterred substantive debate, so it'll kind of get down to the same sort of arguments as the RBI. But you're getting somewhere where you can read an offensive, you can have an interim that's worded offensively. Is the only way you can generate offense on theory through something your opponent reads? Oh, you could read another shell. Right, exactly. Like, you can just uplayer. You could read um, a shell that says that their shell was bad, or you could read a new shell and you can weigh between shells. Um, so it doesn't seem to necessarily be the case that like the only place that you can generate offense on theory is through access to an RVI. Uh, so that's potentially um, an answer to this argument about reciprocity. Um, anything else you guys can think of? I, I'll give you a hint. There's one of the arguments for uh, drop the argument uh, that I think is relevant to the RVI's good slash bad. Yeah. So RAs are bad because um, substance education. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if like if there's no RBI, then at any point we can go back to substance. Yeah. Like if you get an RBI, that means that the entire debate will collapse down to theoretical issues, uh, which means that you can't have an important discussion of substance. Cool. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this so far? Yeah. So like, for T-shell, should you also read some substance? What do you mean? Oh, like, do you want to also read offense on substance if you're reading T? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I would say so because uh, you never really want your opponent to, like, know what you're going to go for in your next speech uh, because that means that they have to spread themselves out a but over, like, a couple of layers. Uh, so, like, if they know that you have to go for T in the 1AR, they could go for, like, Drop the argument, reasonability. Um, yeah, drop the argument, reasonability, like fairness not a voter, education not a voter. Um, and then read a counter interpretation. Um, and then it makes it really hard for you in the two and hour because you have to be back all of those arguments. Uh, and you don't have any out on substance. Any other questions? Cool. So let's see, we have only three minutes left. Um, so you guys can go. I'm just going to sit here at the front until uh, for like a couple of minutes. So if anyone has any remaining questions, feel free to just come up to me um, and I'll be happy to answer them. Hey. Yeah. So do you want, like, if I was, if someone ran theory on me, would I have to read a interpretation or could I just, like, make a general argument? You'd have to read a counter interpretation. Okay, so you have to read a counter interpretation. Yeah, potentially under reasonability, you don't need a counter interpretation, um, but I would say it's always true. Okay. So yeah. I was thinking about running some disclosure theory for practice debates. <laughs> I don't know. I I still like questioning whether I should or shouldn't. Yeah. Like, I know it's like really annoying. Tell me. But so. I'm not sure. Yeah. Are are people in your lab hiding preps? Yeah. I, so you could, I feel like there's probably, it's probably not the most productive thing to do in practice rounds, because you'd probably just like learn more reading other shows. <laughs> but yeah, I would talk to your lab leaders about people hiding prep. Rafi and Sunny are not going to be happy with me running disclosure theory for sure. Yeah, so I would, yeah, I would probably use practice rounds to like experiment with other okay. kinds of arguments. I have no idea what I'm hitting, so like, and all oh, my yeah. stuff is closed. So. No, yeah, that's definitely. Yeah.